Thank you, Henry. Uh, and uh, welcome, everybody, from wherever you are. I'm speaking to you from uh, just north of Barcelona in Spain, and it's exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, give me an indication of where, what time zone you're in. Anybody, it's uh, just turned midnight. Which would mean probably somewhere in uh, the far east of Asia or the Pacific even. Anybody who's at 11 o'clock now? I'm just... Okay. All right, we're getting lots of time. 10 p.m. in Beijing, 11 o'clock. Wow, wow. Okay, so complete spread. 8 a.m. in Canada. Uh, <laughs> it's 11 o'clock in Tokyo. 5 in Saudi. Wow. 4 o'clock in... Sw it's 4 o'clock? Um, fabulous. Okay, so I really appreciate the fact that some of you have stayed up late to attend this uh, webinar, and some of you have got up early to attend it, and I hope to make it worth your while. So I've got 30 minutes to talk about how to answer most learner questions, uh, and then we'll have five minutes or so at the end uh, to uh, deal with any questions that come up. So post your questions into the chat box, and Henry and Sarah, I think, will be collecting them and fielding them to me uh, at the end if we've got time. Um, I have to say that the topic of this talk is a kind of, uh, it's one that uh, I haven't found any literature on. It's not something that's addressed in books on methodology, uh, and yet it's a real issue for most practicing teachers, particularly teachers who are just starting out. How do you answer? the learner's questions. Um, the only advice I've ever seen about this actually was uh, in a language school in, um, in uh, London uh, a number of years ago, and uh, they actively discouraged students asking their teachers questions, and they gave this advice to their teachers which was, if I remember, it was like, if a student asks a question about grammar, answer it very quickly, speaking very quickly, using very technical language, so that they will never <laughs> ask a question again. So the idea of, and this was we're talking some time back, of course, it was, it was the methodology was to discourage any discussion of grammar, and so this was one way of doing it. It seems to me that's probably not uh, the best way, certainly not going to satisfy the students. Um, of course, we need to know uh, what the motive is for students' questions, and this can vary a lot um, from the I need to know something about the language kind of question. Uh, but also, of course, there's perhaps less benign reasons why uh, students ask questions. Sometimes it's just to kind of pass the time um, or to waste the time even. And we've all had questions like that, I'm sure. Um, and then there's those questions, the difficult questions, where the students are actually trying to test the teacher. And I remember when I first started teaching uh, in my... <laughs> In my first uh, two or three months of teaching uh, in a school on the south coast of England, I had a group of uh, students. Um, it, they were all sailors, in fact. Or, uh, <laughs> and one of them said to me, excuse me, Mr. Scott, can you explain I wish? That is to say the grammar of I wish. And, yeah. You know, Bear in mind, I had just completed a four-week rapid pre-service course. My knowledge of grammar was shaky, to say the least. I never, ever thought about the grammar of I wish. And I started to try to explain what I wish means when you want something. But, and the students said, but yes, why do we say I wish I had a lot of money? 
uh, <laughs> I was completely scummed. In other words, what the students were doing is simply testing my authority, as it were, to teach them English. So there's those kinds of questions too. But I'm not going to do, oh, there's a fifth, the fourth kind of question, which is kind of personal questions like, um, are you married? And uh, how much do you earn? And that kind of thing. So I'm not going to deal with that today either. I'm going to deal with questions which relate specifically to language and which are motivated by the need to know. And what I've done is I've kind of got a typology here of questions, typical questions which students ask. But typically they'll ask me, how do you say X in English? And that's uh, particularly during uh, productive activities, speaking or writing activities. Uh, and, and sort of reverse of that is doing reading or listening activities is what does this mean? What does this word mean? What does this phrase mean? What does this expression mean? Another kind of question is sort of like this. Can you say blah, 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 blah? Or another way of phrasing it is, is this wrong? Yeah? Is it wrong to say uh, X? And that's often, um, again, during productive activities when students are doing writing, uh, or preparing for a speaking activity. Another question is often uh, phrased something like this, what's the difference between X and Y? What's the difference between, we'll come look at some examples of these in a minute. Uh, and then slightly more challenging, and perhaps a little bit more threatening, is questions like this, you said mm, but here it says mm. Yeah, you taught us this, but here it says this, you know, explain. I'll come back to these uh, specific examples of these questions in a minute, but let's look at some, that's a kind of typology, if you like, of the different kinds of questions. It's not exhaustive. But let's look at the kind of possible uh, teacher responses. And again, I've kind of organized them. Well, before we do that, just let me throw some... Uh, questions into the chat box that you've been asked that you've found rather tricky or difficult. Uh, searching back in your memory, what questions do you remember being asked that perhaps you didn't do a very good job of? And I'm just looking here. What's the difference between, oh, yeah. What's the difference between for and since? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> why should I learn what you teach us? That's very challenging. Why do you add S to the third person singer? Why? If only we did. What's the difference between love and lover? Hmm, interesting. I've never been asked that one. Why the English language has that S sound? <laughs> very good question. If only it didn't. Questions start with why is tricky. It is very tricky. You know, why is the English language like it is? Why doesn't the author use another word? Uh, what is the difference between even if and even though? Oh my god, oh, I don't think I've ever been asked that. Anyway, then what modals, yeah, lots of questions about modality that are really kind of problematic. Okay, fantastic. So I'm not alone then in saying that sometimes we get asked questions which are kind of tricky. Why have breakfast but not eat breakfast, not take breakfast? Exactly. What's the difference between, uh, to take a break and to break or to have a rest and to rest. That one came up recently. Okay, fantastic. All right, you're on the right page. Let's look though now, before we sort of address specific questions, let's look at typical teacher responses to students' questions. One is to give a direct answer. So the student says, what does this mean? And you tell them. In an ideal world, we would be able to be nicer to give direct answers to all students' questions. Often it's not. For one reason or the other, you don't know the answer or you decide that it's not relevant. So you hedge. Yeah? You kind of say, well, it's not really important right now. 
I'll get back to you about that. Let's just move on. It's not a very important word in the text, etc. That's hedging. Hedging is kind of um, not answering directly, avoiding the issue. And of course, one reason teachers hedge uh, secretly is that they don't know, but you're never going to say, I don't know. So you're more likely to hedge. Um, another response is that you ask for more information. So you say, okay, but what's the context? The student says, what does this mean? What does uh, well mean? Okay, but give me a context I need to know. Yeah, or give me an example. And a bit advantage of this is, of course, it gives you time to think. Um, a third strategy, or a fourth strategy, is to throw it open to the class. So don't answer directly, but you say, okay, what does everybody think? Does anybody know? So student X has asked a question, ask the class, what do you think? Anybody know? Anybody? Now that's excellent for two reasons, because it gives you thinking time, but it also pushes the question back and gives the, task, the class some responsibility for kind of sorting out their own problems. And chances are, if the class is you know, big enough, that there will be somebody who comes up with an answer or something like an answer, in which case, again, you can then address it and fine tune it. Or, alternatively, you can throw it back to the student. You can say, well, what do you think? What do you think it means? The student says, what does this mean? Well, what do you think? Look at the context. Um, or you could even ask the student, well, why? <laughs> why do you want to know? Why is it important? Why does it matter? Yeah? So again, it gives you uh, thinking time, but it uh, also gives the learner a chance to uh, explain, you know, what the relevance of the question is, and that sometimes is very important. Okay, so those are kind of um, five strategies that teachers use, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm saying they all have their, their usefulness. Um, let's look now at specific examples, and let's go back to the um, the kinds of student, the kinds of questions that students ask. Um, so the student who says, "How do you say X in English?" Obviously, this helps if you know the student, if you know the student's first language. So if you're teaching a monolingual group and they're all Russian speakers or Chinese speakers, and the student says, "How do you say this word in Russian or this word in Chinese in English?" Uh, then you can give them a quick response. And this is the enormous advantage of knowing the student's first language. But you do need to know it. Uh, but even then, uh, it's probably wise to check uh, what the context is. Because, I mean, you know, a word out of context can mean any number of things. Student, Spanish-speaking student says, how do you say locale? In English, locale, locale, or local, no, but hang on, do you mean the adjective or do you mean the noun, locale? So, uh, give me a sentence uh, that it's in, and again, this helps you situate uh, the question and also gives you thinking time. Um, the question, what does why mean, yeah, what does this word mean, or what does... Uh, Perambulator mean, again, ask for context. Okay, tell me the sentence. Read me the sentence if they're working from a text. Give me the sentence. Um, and often that helps sort it out. Uh, of course, you can then say, well, what do you think it means in the sentence? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? Can you see any words that are similar to it? On the third question, can you say, hmm? Or is X wrong? Um, this is common when students have uh, a bit like number E, actually, that they've kind of been taught something and they find what seems to be an exception. Uh, famously, of course, the, um, the McDonald's slogan, can you say, I'm loving it? Or is I'm loving it wrong? 
this is where it really helps uh, if you've got access to an online corpus. If you're in a smart classroom, you're online, you've got internet access, a computer, a screen, of course, then you can go in and you can Google it. Or you can go into a corpus and find examples and see, what are that? Some people say it. It's not common, but blah, blah, blah. Because that, that does take time and it assumes that the issue is important enough to matter. But I think that the important thing is, is to remember that nothing is wrong, really. There's always a context somewhere in which an expression will fit. Particularly if it's well formed. I am loving it, I am knowing her, I am understanding it. Okay, the grammar says, mm -mm, the grammar rule says no, but it's not impossible to think of a context in which that would be perfectly appropriate. So as a rule of thumb, say, nothing is wrong, just some things are more probable than others. Some things are more common, some things are more frequent than others. It depends on the context. Um, which means that often for these kind of questions like can you say or is X wrong, the only honest answer is, well, mm, it depends. And of course, that's not, a, it's not an answer that the students want because it's rather vague and they say, oh, yeah, okay, it depends on what. Um, looking at number D, what's the difference between, I mean, can, I mean, you saw, you know, what's the difference between different modal verbs? What's the difference between will and going to? How many times have I been asked that you're teaching going to for the future? And the student says, but um, what's the difference between will and going to? Now, it's very tempting to kind of stop everything and say, okay, well, this is the difference. Blah, 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 blah. This is, you know, give a little mini presentation, as it were. But that's risky because, first of all, it cuts into the lesson. It distracts from what it is that you're trying to teach. You're trying to teach going to. You really, you know, you want some space to teach that. You don't want to be teaching all the other future exponents as well. And also, it's kind of like, well, does anybody else have this problem? Um, the danger is you might end up just giving a little mini lesson to one individual student. So this is where sometimes you may have to postpone, use a postponing tactic and say, well, listen, don't worry about that now. Uh, we'll come back to that. It's in the syllabus. You know, we'll do all this. Um, but it's not relevant now. Um, and there's some questions that really, you know, not even professional grammarians can give you a clear answer. Questions about prepositions, for example. What's the difference between in and on and at? Why do we say at 5 o'clock, but on Sunday, in 1990, and so on? There are reasons. There are reasons. But it gets fairly complicated and abstruse. Um, and then finally, uh, you said X, but here it says Y. This is the kind of teacher's nightmare, because inevitably, we have to simplify grammar particularly at lower levels. And inevitably, there are examples which contradict these simplifications. Um, so, I mean, uh, typically, again, with the example of I'm loving it, for example, um, you said you can't use love in the progressive form, but here it says, I'm loving it, or you can't use understand, but here it says, I've been understanding it, etc. I think this is where we really have to appeal to the fact that language is fuzzy. Language is slippery. Language is variable. Language moves and changes according to context, according to place, according to time. It is not fixed in stone. And it's that we really need to communicate that to our students, I think. So we're, we're, even your, think of their own language and how things shift from region to region and from time to time and how the language changes. Diane Larson Freeman, who's one of the uh, linguists who I most respect in the world and has written a lot about grammar and written grammars of English, she says, Teachers and students need to know, if they don't know already, that grammar is not a linguistic 
straight jacket. You know what? A straight, a straight jacket. It is much more flexible. There is rarely one right answer to a grammar question. Now, I think that should be written above the classroom blackboard. There is rarely one right answer to a grammar question. It should be it should be made into a t-shirt that all the students wear. It's really such an important point. Uh, grammar is a moving target and there's no one right, there's no answer to every question. So on that note, uh, let me just now uh, suggest some general strategies for dealing with uh, student questions. Uh, and then we'll throw it open to um, your questions. So I've got six uh, recommendations uh, or strategies. First of all, don't pretend you know if you don't. We're human. We're not perfect. We're not gods. We're teachers. <laughs> we're great teachers. We're fantastic teachers. We're very well trained teachers. But some things, language is enormous. Language is limitless and we can't expect to know everything about it. So don't pretend you know. There's nothing more embarrassing than watching a teacher pretending to explain something they don't really know. So if you don't know, then I'll get back to you. It's a good question. It's a very good question. But I'm not going to answer it now. Yeah? Uh, but if you do adopt that strategy, if you say you'll get back to them, do. Please do. Don't forget. Write it down. Remember. Tie a knot. Students will really respect you so much if you say, look, I don't have an answer to that now, but I will get back to you. And in the next lesson, you have the answer. Students love that. Um, and it's, it, it is no threat to your authority as a teacher. They will respect you even more, but not if you don't get back to them. So do remember that. Do your homework. Go back. Look it up. Have a good grammar. Look, I've got hundreds of them. And I'm still looking up stuff that I don't know. I promise you, there's so many things I don't know about grammar. And I've written books about grammar. And I'm still having to say to students and my trainees, listen, I don't really know. That's a really good question, but I'll, I'll get back to you. Third piece of advice is don't turn a question into a long dialogue with just one student. Don't turn it into a kind of conversation with this one student who's got this problem. If it is just one student and the others are not really interested, then postpone it, put it on hold, forget about it for the time being. Huh? Or, even better, involve all the others. It's good language practice apart from anything else. But don't turn, you know, don't become uh, focused on this one particular student. Because it will encourage them to, I mean, you know, uh, it, it could well be a kind of time-wasting strategy apart from anything else. For those of you who are not uh, speakers of your learner's language, uh, don't attempt translation unless you're really equipped to do so. Now, obviously, this is not a problem for those of you who are uh, uh, speakers of the language of your learners. You're very well equipped to use translation. But if you're not, then be careful, because you can get into a terrible mess uh, with translation if you're not a speaker, a native speaker. I mean, if you're not a speaker of this, learn this first language, is what I'm saying. Or vice versa. Um, if a student asks, for a, you know, uh, how do you say um, chorizo in, in English, um, be careful, even if you are an native speaker of Spanish, that you do know uh, enough about English to know what they're asking and what the translation is. And then a fifth piece of advice is always elicit context. A language is context sensitive. You take a word out of context is like taking a fish out of water. You've got to have the context to know what it means. 
You need to know whether it's a verb, it's a noun, or it's an adjective. You need to know whether perhaps it's in a colloquial or informal sense, a slang sense of the word. Um, no word has a meaning that resists or survives being decontextualized, or very few words, scientific words maybe, but that's about it. And finally, uh, my final piece of advice is uh, don't be afraid of questions. Encourage them. Really, I mean, when it's, to me, if I walk into a class and I'm observing a class and students are asking the teacher questions, I'm, I feel really good because I, this is a lovely dynamic here. We've got a kind of dialogue going on. Uh, where the students are emboldened, not afraid to ask questions because they know and they're confident in their teacher enough that she will give them their answers. If not now, maybe tomorrow. But I love walking to classrooms where there is a kind of dialogue going on. And let me tell you about a fantasy I have. Uh, I've always had this idea of teaching a lesson and I invite you to do this and, 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 get, and email me and tell, you, tell me how it works. Maybe you've got a class of about intermediate students, B1, B2. And on the syllabus or in the course book, it says review uh, the present perfect on the assumption that they've met the present perfect in previous courses, but of course nobody gets the present perfect. Uh, so it's on the syllabus, let's review it. Now, this is alternative one, you go in, you've got a lovely lesson, a presentation, you look at various examples of the present perfect, you elicit some rules, you divide them up, you practice it, and blah, blah, blah. Great, yeah, fantastic. What about this for an alternative lesson? You go in and you write on the board, Present perfect. And you say, think of all the questions you would like to ask me about the present perfect. Now get into groups, get into pairs or whatever, prepare some questions. Five questions per pair or five questions per group. So this way, the students by forcing them to think of the questions of what they don't know about the present perfect, it forces them to talk to each other and maybe discover things that they can teach each other anyway until they get their five questions and then they hit you with the questions. And of course, you're such a fabulous teacher that you can deal with the questions, but you don't have to answer them on the spot. You can throw them back again. So the students might say, what's the difference between the present perfect and the past simple? And you say, well, there must be somebody in the room who can answer that. Or you put up two sentences. I went to Rome. I've been to Rome. Okay. Give me some context for each of those sentences. But you see what I mean? The presentation is coming out of the students' questions. And doesn't that seem to be more likely to address what it is that they need to know that if you come in giving your beautiful presentation without actually finding out what it is that they need to know. So what I'm saying is that student questions are so important that they could be made the basis of your methodology. Not for every lesson necessarily, but certainly for some lessons and at some levels. Um, so <laughs> that's my dream. Um, I'm now going to, uh, I think we're actually almost on um, the last minute of my time before I throw it over to your questions. And so, in fact, I'm asking you any questions. There's a wonderful scene in a Groucho Marx movie. I can't remember which one. I think when he's the president of Fredonia and he gives a speech. At the end of the speech, he says, any questions? And then he says, or any answers? So, so I'm asking you now, any questions or any answers? Uh, and I'm calling upon, I hope, Henry and Sarah, who may feel some questions to me um, that they might have caught. Oh, 
as we move along. But I'm staring fixedly at the chat box now. Okay, Henry's saying, write them in the chat box. How can we teach or organize students to ask suitable communicative views in correct context? Communicative questions. Uh, mm, role play. Dialogues. Um, I'm looking at, uh, uh, thank you, interviews, yes. Any activity which involves question and answer, dialogue, interviews, etc., is good practice. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Romania. Uh, what should I do with students who think I lost it? It's going too quickly. Uh, hang on, I'm just going back. Uh, what do you do with students who think they know the language better than the others, even the teacher? Yeah, well, uh, respect them, respect them. Don't diss them, don't dismiss them, because uh, you don't want to alienate students who think they know more about the language. I think don't make a fool of them, because that will make them your enemy. Um, use them where they, you can, but, you know, everybody likes to think they know a little bit more about grammar than the next person. So don't make it competitive. Is it good to have examples of good questions? Yes, excellent. Thank you, Edwin. I think, oh, fantastic question. Have examples around the room. How do you say X in English? What does Y mean? Especially for beginners. Have these questions around the, the wall so the students can use them. And also, they're wonderful because they embed really useful grammar. How do you say? Present simple. What does X mean? Present simple. Questions. Fantastic. Auxiliary verbs. So, yes, very good idea. Thank you, Edwin. Um, timelines, yeah, you could put up a timeline, or two timelines, and say, okay, ask me questions about it. Thank you, thank you, everybody. How can we respond when students are trying to challenge us by their questions? Yeah, <laughs> um, difficult. I mean, if it's if they're really trying to. Uh, um, question your authority, then you have to be careful because I think you have to show that you understand the game that they're playing uh, and say, I don't know, you have to give a message that, uh, but I don't think it's wise to look threatened or challenged. I mean, when students ask me, when those students ask me what does I wish mean, I was completely, I mean, I really did lose a lot of authority and I felt awful. But I mean, that's life, that's teaching. You can't learn to teach uh, overnight. You can't learn the grammar of the language overnight. Uh, but you, it's your responsibility as teachers to keep learning about grammar. And uh, that's where having a book like I can advertise, can't I, Henry? A Macmillan book, the A to Z of ELT, which has lots of answers to questions about grammar and lots of other things as well. Okay, folks, um, I think kind of we're out of time. It's been fantastic. I noticed that we have uh, my God, nearly 500 people in the room. This is really amazing. It's a record for me, and I'm really grateful, as I say, for your um, being here, for those of you particularly for whom it's been an effort either staying awake or, or waking up. Uh, <laughs> So um, I hope this was of use to you. As I said before, it's not a, so a topic that I've seen dealt with in methodology books, um, but I do think it's one that uh, is part of the daily life of teaching a language. So on that note, uh, I think, Henry... Thank uh, you, Scott. I'll hand Fantastic back to you. talk. Um, just going through all the comments there, lots of very positive feedback. Uh, looks like that went down very well.